The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are in the world, and welcome to this webinar on finance mechanisms to achieve the SDGs. I am Berenice Lamblin, conference producer at Climate Action. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to welcome so many listeners on this afternoon's webinar. Uh, we have received over 600 registrations, so it's a bit of a full house and a testament to the excellent speakers we have participating today and the importance of the subject area. So please be aware that this session is being recorded and a link will be emailed to you shortly after the webinar is complete, so you will be able to listen again and share with your colleagues if you wish. Just to let you know a little bit about climate action. So for the last 10 years, we have worked in a unique partnership with UN Environment to develop their official publication and events. This is with the aim of establishing partnerships between the public and the private sectors to accelerate green economic growth. Today's webinar takes place ahead of the inaugural Sustainable Investment Forum Europe to be held in Paris on the 13th of March 2018. And it's organized in official partnership with UNEP Finance Initiative. The forum will gather European asset owners and managers, commercial banks, development banks, private venture capital, European and national policy makers, and think tanks. Speakers currently include Olivier Gerson, who is Director General for Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union at the European Commission. Olivier Rousseau, Executive Director, Fonds de Réserve de <coughs> pour les Retraites, or FRR. Karen Smith-Inihenacho, who is Global Head of Ownership Strategies at Norges Bank Investment Management. Andres Hallemeyer, Sustainability Manager and Assistant to the Chief Investment Officer at the German Pension Fund Bayerische Versorgungskammer, and many more. Please do visit europe.sustainableinvestmentforum.org for more information and to download the full agenda. Which brings me to today's webinar on finance mechanisms to achieve the SDGs. Over two years ago, in September 2015, 193 governments adopted the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, which provide a framework for global development and set quantitative targets for the world to achieve by 2030. A global investment of five to seven trillion dollars a year from 2015 to 2030 is estimated to be needed to fund the SDGs, 50% of which should come from the private sector. The entry into force of the Paris Agreement has reinforced nations' determination to combat climate change, but a lot more still need to be done in order to achieve the goals that were set globally. While investment opportunities in low carbon innovation, climate adaptation, clean infrastructure and energy are growing, key challenges still prevent most of the needed financial flows. So government and the investment community need to work together in order to assess needs, set processes, develop innovative financial mechanisms and adapt existing instruments for funding the SDGs. Over the next hour, we will explore the following questions around financing the SDGs. What assessment, measurement and reporting processes are necessary to understand the needs for funding for the SDGs? How can we set up innovative processes and adapt existing financial instruments to organize finance flows? What is necessary for adapting sustainable finance processes to the singularities of countries and sectors? And what is the role of collaboration between public and private sector to accelerate the investment? I feel extremely privileged to welcome two excellent speakers this afternoon to address this topic. So firstly, we welcome Karin Ab, who is Positive Impact Finance Program Lead at UNEP Finance Initiative. Since 2015, Karin's core focus is to develop the Positive Impact Finance Initiative, which aims to catalyze the finance sector's ability to finance sustainable development as per the SDGs. At the heart of the initiative lies the belief that the progress achieved to date in environmental and social risk management can be built on to deliver a more holistic appraisal of the positive and negative impacts of financial institutions, financing and investment. As a key step to switch on mainstream finance's capacity to help drive the transition to a new and more sustainable economy. We are then joined by Gerben Havekamp, who is the executive director of the INDEX Initiative and a founding partner of the World Benchmarking Alliance. Gerben founded the INDEX Initiative, which is a center of expertise that seeks to propel the use of benchmarks to engage companies in delivering on the SDGs. 
Their purpose is to bring clarity on the role and performance of companies in contributing to the SDGs that are closest to their core business. Aviva, the UN Foundation, BSDC and Index Initiatives are in the consultation phase of the World Benchmarking Alliance to develop, fund, house and safeguard free publicly available corporate sustainability benchmarks aligned with the SDGs. Each of those two speakers will take five to ten minutes to present their views, following which we will take questions from our listeners. You can submit your questions via Twitter using hashtag SINVEU or using the question box on the GoToWebinar bar to the right of your screen. So please don't be shy. We will try and get through as many relevant questions as possible in the hour time frame. And with that, I shall now hand over to our first speaker, Karen, Karen Eep, App, sorry. Uh, Karen, I'm going to unmute you right now, and you should uh, be able to take the comments. Karen, are you with us? Thank you very much, Agnes. Yes, and first of all, Agnes, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to, uh, to speak on your webinar today as uh, you prepare for your big event in, uh, in Europe next, uh, next year, which uh, we look forward to, of course. And yes, I think you may need to uh, keep the commands of the uh, of the okay. slides. Yeah, that's I fine. Don't seem to I be able to move them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello to uh, to everyone. Um, just a short um, word, first of all, on um, UNEP Finance Initiative, which uh, some may be familiar with, others not. Um, UNEPFI is effectively the United Nations Environment Programme's Finance Initiative, a partnership between the United Nations Environment Programme and a network of over 200 financial institutions globally, including banks, investors, and insurance companies. Um, the initiative has been working since um, 25 years now, very much as a, as a pioneer in the, in the sustainable finance uh, space uh, to promote sustainable finance uh, and work um, directly with the finance sector in better understanding um, sustainability issues and, uh, and addressing them. Um, in terms of the positive impact initiative um, that is carried by uh, by Unibify, I'd just like to uh, to give first of all a, a bit of a, a backdrop um, as to what underpins or what were the the origins a little bit of uh, of, of launching um, a new line of, of work, um, the, the positive impact initiative. Uh, really, the the origin of of this work lies with an interest. Um, I just ahead of the release of the, the SDGs in thinking more broadly about um, what we can do to finance sustainable development, sustainable finance agenda, um, having been um, perhaps dominated to, to some extent and, uh, and for good reason on a perhaps more of a, a risk-based approach to, uh, to sustainability. Um, we wanted to really take uh, a new turn, an additional turn, and to look specifically at the question of, of financing, not just um, to understand uh, better what financial institutions um, were already doing um, and contributing to an agenda such as the SDGs, um, but really to try and see um, what could be done to get into the so-called financing gap per se. So that's uh, you know um, just a, a bit of a, a backdrop. Uh, to uh, to the initiative. Um, in uh, in starting out, that led us to um, you know to a conclusion and to uh, to a new proposal, which was that a new approach um, is needed, an approach which we call impact based financing, and which is what um, we think will be an indispensable complement to the many um, good and solid. Um, initiatives and approaches that are already underway, um, including um, you know, the bond markets, impact investing, blended finance, um, if we wish to really mobilize private finance at the needed scale. So it's this impact-based approach um, which is effectively the, the heart of the initiative and which I'd like to um, briefly introduce 
um, to, to those on the webinar today. Um, I see you have the, the first slide uh, there for you. There's uh, only a couple. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to, um, you know, to go back to basics as a starting point, understand why we think uh, a new approach uh, is needed in the first instance, and then explain what that new, um, new approach is about. Um, so the basics is basically looking at some of the, the figures um, of the SDGs and the SDG funding gap. As we started out on this work with the UNIPFI members um, a couple of years back, um, we found that there was not necessarily as much information and data available as one might have imagined, given the you know, increasing um, demands and expectations on the finance sector to, uh, to contribute actively to the SDG financing gap. And so that led us to trying to look at some of the figures again ourselves and to try and explain those um, as that would be key for us to determine what the, the contribution of the private sector and the private finance sector in particular would be. And as you can see there on the, uh, you know, on the, on the slide, um, what we try to do is effectively understand the financing gap under the following terms. That is, the, in determining the investment needs first, and then subtracting from that effectively the SDG financial flows, be they public or be they private, so that we really understand what the magnitude, but also what the nature of that gap is. And so while in terms of the magnitude of the gap, and you can see there um, that it's, uh, it's showing at 2.5 trillion, while that aligns fairly well with the figures that traditionally um, can be found um, in, uh, in, in what literature there does exist, um, going deeper into that research also showed some very important um, distinctions that we need to bear in mind if we're interested in resolving effectively the, the gap and the difficult part of, of SDG financing as opposed to simply contributing to SDG objectives overall. And so here, um, uh, what I'd like to point out to you is you know, these, these three bullets you see here. If we're looking at uh, developed countries, obviously the, the gap is smaller. And you know, on, on that basis, we estimate that you know, going forward with existing businesses and doing you know, better and more of what we have in terms of financial products might take us you know, quite, uh, quite far in terms of resolving SDG needs. So we've probably got, got about 90% already. In emerging and developing countries, that figure um, drops quite dramatically to just under 60%. And if we take specifically the case of Africa, that figure drops even further to just 10% um, of, of the needs being covered with you know, businesses as usual. So why is this important? This is important because we tend to hear quite often that um, you know, in terms of SDGs, um, we need to redirect capital, which of course is absolutely true. What we need to understand, however, that um, you know, funds and capital is available on those markets where the SDGs are closest to completion and where existing models might be able to take us almost to completion. That same capital is not available in the markets where the SDG financing gap is most acute. And what the implication of that is that breaching the gap is not only a question of redirecting capital, it's actually one of capital creation. Now, that is um, a, a fundamental distinction in the sense that it means that you know at the end of the day the core question that we need to be asking ourselves is can some of the SDG needs that are not currently basically um, at the heart of any you know business models that are, of any businesses themes linked to uh, whether it's health whether it's education whether it's energy and access to energy um, to give just a, a few examples, can those become the heart of a business model of value creation? So that is really the, you know, the, the fundamental um, basis of, of the question and on which we you know, premise effectively the, the work of the initiative. And so going back to what I was saying at the beginning in terms of we think a new approach is needed, an impact-based approach, that um, proposition stems directly from you know, these this, this analysis of the figures that you see here, in the sense that our, our thinking is, you know, if effectively at the moment what we have is a major business gap, and that you know, the business gap is around those impacts that we need to achieve, then you know, we need to have 
a way of looking at the market, a way of looking at business opportunities that is actually impact-based. And so the, the proposition effectively um, with the Positive Impact Initiative is to see how we can um, evolve effectively uh, financial analysis, uh, the collective, I guess, financial and extra financial analysis to get a better understanding of impacts in an integral way so that we're basically in a position to identify potential opportunities and spread also um, the, uh, you know, the amount of um, engagement that we can expect from existing businesses to do more, to ramp up um, their, um, their work that can, uh, that can contribute to the SDGs. Next slide, please. If you can click again, please, Bernice. Thank you. So, as a first, um, as a core part of um, of our work, as a result, is really to uh, our work has been to prepare a framework that financial institutions and financial players, as well as their stakeholders, might use um, to move effectively to that 2.0 in a way of analysis that would integrate um, impact very much from the beginning of a process. That's something that can be used for identification, selection purposes, for structuring products, as well as then monitoring and reporting. We see today a lot of focus on impact that tends to happen rather towards the end of the process where we're interested in reporting and communicating on impacts that have been achieved. So here we have a framework that enables us to bring that right to the beginning and as a result, um, structure um, and produce a number of products on many different um, sustainability related topics and to engage with clients and with MVC companies on a great number of different impacts. To, without going into the details of the, uh, of the principles, what I'd like to just call your attention to is the fact that you know, within those four principles you have the first one which is a definition of positive impact finance, which ultimately is the finance that you need to achieve sustainable development goals. Um, and that definition is that positive impact finance is that which will make a positive contribution to one or several of the three pillars of sustainable development, environmental, social, and developmental. Once any potential negative impacts have been duly identified and then either avoided, mitigated, or compensated. So it's important to note here um, that we're not looking at this as a netting out effect of so much positive cancels so much negative, but that you know we cannot speak of an overall positive impact if we have not had some kind of visibility treatment and addressing of any potential negative impacts. That um, is something that shows then through uh, our principle two on frameworks. We wish to then obviously qualify in terms of the kind of frameworks and methodologies that are put in place, which will obviously be different and require different levels um, of detail depending on the kind of product that you're issuing and the kind of kind of underlying asset. Um, the level of proximity to end impacts obviously is very different from one product to another and from one underlying to another. So that is that is fully understood. I'd like to also call your attention just to principle three, which is the principle of transparency, where again, rather than setting a set methodology and setting um, you know, a set number of um, you know, interpretation of what is positive and negative, which is something that can be very subjective, especially from geography to geography, we wish to ensure that there is transparency around the frameworks that are used, the impact categories that are used, how decisions are made, so that then stakeholders and public and private investors um, can basically um, vote with their feet, so to speak. Finally, um, on the question of assessment, our ambition would be that in fine positive impact products, that is products that are um, developed in alignment with what is said here in the principles, would be assessed on the basis of the impacts that they produce either their multiplicity, their volume, their additionality, potentially in terms of um, enabling private finance to get um, into uh, a series of impacts that we have not seen before, although this is an area of definition that remains to be consolidated. I should that we're really at the beginning um, of, uh, of this process. Um, and then also notions such as the optimization of public money if there was any involved. So that's, uh, that's 
um, a brief overview of, of the principles. Thank you, Berenice, for the, for the next slide. That inserts itself into a longer roadmap, which I'll just leave there for, for your consideration. As said, we started out with that vision for a new approach, which is something that we put out in a manifesto um, initially in, uh, in, in, at the end of 2015 um, with uh, a roadmap in which we identify the need for a, a fit-for-purpose framework that enables us to move towards this impact-based approach, which are the principles I should just briefly outline to you. And then beyond that, um, there is the notion of um, developing effectively um, a new kind of interaction between public and private actors. Um, at the end of the day, our perspective is that even with this um, new approach to, to products and the kind of engagement that that can lead to between financiers and their clients, um, or investee companies, there will also need be need uh, a need for something additional. Um, and in what uh, what we specifically have in mind is the kind of conversation we want to have um, with public actors as the private sector, both financial and broader corporate sector. Um, at the moment, many discussions will tend to focus on policy or regulatory questions around enabling environments, around regulatory frameworks, um, around pricing, or we will also have you know, dialogues that center around better blending of different sources of finance. We would like to suggest one further conversation with the public sector, which is effectively one having to do with actual planning and solution building up front of some of the programs and some of the um, uh, some of the processes that are that are put in place to address um, specific, you know, SDG issues. Precisely because at the moment, um, many of these topics um, are not part and parcel or embedded in business models. Many things revert back to um, to the public sector and to public funds, and the private sector becomes involved at the time when it's time to build a school, build a road, or build a hospital. And yet, that is not necessarily the most cost-effective way, um, nor indeed the way um, to potentially do things on a on a commercial basis and relieve um, some of the public financing. But to be able to look at that and look at alternative ways of of proceeding and of how to reduce cost to impact and how to distribute risk slightly differently, um, we have a perception that it would be necessary to engage at earlier stages of actual planning and solution building. So this is something that we're starting to engage a number of public actors at the municipal and provincial level to do. I will leave that with you. Maybe the last slide, Berenice, just gives a snapshot of who the uh, members of the, uh, the Positive Impact Initiative are. It's a subgroup of the members of UNIPFI, at least as far as financial institutions are concerned. I do want to add, though, that the positive impact community goes beyond the financial community. They're not reflected on this slide yet, um, but, uh, but you will be seeing more of them. Um, so it does include, as said, public players, corporate players, and of course, you know, the broader ecosystem um, of, um, of financial analysts, raters, extra financial raters, with which you know, we are in close conversation, which we have been as we develop the principles and as we're moving now more to implementation stages and uh, exploring also some of these uh, new, uh, new solution building approaches. So I would only leave it on the idea that you know, we're very welcome to exchange more and we hope to be working with all of you on uh, impact-based finance and on producing um, positive impact finance that will serve the SDGs going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen, for this great presentation. And so I will now hand over to our second speaker, Gerben Havekamp. So Gerben, I will unmute you now and you should be able to join us. Can you hear us, Gerben? Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Corinne, for the presentation. Uh, I think it's a nice overview and I hope um, our work can sort of uh, be a piece of the puzzle to the solution. I need you to do the slides as well for me because the, yes, thank you. So the, um, before we move to the next slide, I'd like to say a couple of things about the, about uh, Index Initiative, Aviva, UN Foundation and the B Business Sustainable Development Commission as sort of the core partners to this project. Um, to start with the BSCC, so they, this is a group of um, more or less progressive CEOs that joined together and thought leaders and said, okay, we need to figure out ways how to how do we engage the private sector with the SDGs. 
And there are a number of things that they uh, recommend and they provide also, the, I think it's one of the key things of their work is the business case for why companies should engage with the SDGs because of the market opportunity. Um, uh, but one of the recommend, recommendations they made as well is the need for sort of SDG league tables, benchmarks or league tables, whatever word you prefer, that assess how companies perform and deliver on the SDGs as a key sort of recommendation for engaging the private sector with the SDGs. And um, the UN Foundation is part of this because they provide the essential link uh, to the UN that's, that's core to their mission. Uh, and they help the World Benchmarking Alliance establishing those links with the UN where appropriate. Um, Aviva, most of you will know them, at least on the, on a, uh, in, a, in a webinar like this, they're the biggest UK insurance company, but perhaps more important to this project, they uh, have about 500 million billion pounds asset under management, which they invest in, in companies around the world. And they are keen to see more of these develop benchmarks come out so that they can use that in their engagement and ultimately in their investment strategies as an asset manager. Um, and then last but not least is Index Initiative, the organization that I lead and founded three years ago. Um, and like you rightly said, we, we try to be an, an, a center of expertise for how do you then develop these benchmarks. And together we took the initiative to start the World Benchmarking Alliance. Um, right now, and I talk a bit more about this in the, in the presentation, we are in the middle of the consultation phase, the one that we launched during the UN General Assembly in September last year. Uh, and we really uh, are at the forefront of sort of how do we set up this institution? What should the priorities be and who should be involved? And right now, it's, uh, so far, so good. Uh, and we hope to formally establish the institution, the World Benchmark Alliance, uh, by next year, September, again, during the UN General Assembly. So that as a sort of remarks up front, and I'll talk a bit more detail about the World Benchmark Alliance. So here is the, uh, for your reference, the, the, the link to the report provided by the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, providing a short rationale for why we do need these uh, league tables assessing corporate performance. And on the next slide, you'll see the um, sort of the basic idea. So there are a couple of things I'd like to highlight here. These benchmarks should be publicly available. This is key so that they're, they're, that they're free and accessible for all to see. Uh, there's a lot of information about corporate performance on, the, on ESG or on other and on sort of different sustainability issues, uh, but often behind the paywall. And one of the key things that we try to achieve with this is that everything will be in the public domain. Otherwise, it won't be successful in the, which is about the last point, it's, it's not successful in cre giving credit to companies that lead, and it doesn't create the accountability that we are looking for. Now, to do this, we need to build these benchmarks in a collaborative fashion. So the World Benchmark Alliance will produce benchmarks, but that doesn't mean it sets them. So it will work with companies, with civil society, with government organizations and investors and other stakeholders from the scientific community to together um, set the expectations for an industry uh, on a particular SDG, um, build a methodology around that so that they're set in a truly collaborative manner. Um, and then hopefully, those benchmarks, if, if we do it right, they produce uh, the kind of information that these same stakeholders need for their engagement with companies. So that in its essence is the idea and rationale behind an SDG benchmark. On the next slide, um, there are a couple of um, design principles. And if you go to their website, they're sort of articulated in a bit more uh, and give a bit more context. But this is just to say, so we establish a set of design principles to ensure that the benchmarks that we produce are fair and create impact. And I'm not going to go through all of them, of course, but to highlight a few. In essence, these benchmarks should reflect what society expects from a group of companies, being it an industry or a sector. Uh, so that and so that means that the, the stakeholders I just mentioned, they sort of ref, reflect what society expects from them. So that is key to to informing the benchmark. They should, of course, be independent and impartial, free and public available. They focus on impact, so that, mean, that again means both on the on the positive side, so where can com companies contribute to achieving the SDGs due to more inclusive business models, new R&D, et cetera, et cetera, and where do they need to step up so they don't hamper any progress towards the SDGs. And then a key point is our focus on, <clears throat> on, the, on the relevance, so that means that we include all companies no matter if they're listed, state-owned or privately owned, in a benchmark that we believe are part of the solution uh, to that specific issue. Uh, so in that sense, there is no 
uh, for companies, there's no opt out. All companies in scope uh, will be benchmarked and will be assessed. That's a critical element, of course. Um, on the next slide, you see some of the initial work that we are now doing to sort of map out priorities, um, uh, priority areas for new benchmarks. So what you in, in essence see here is an overview of where we believe some of the, 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 the biggest industries meet the SDGs. Now, people could make a case for why every industry has an impact on all SDGs, uh, and they're probably right, but what we are interested in is, is identifying where um, companies have the, 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 where the core of their business has the biggest impact on the SDGs. And currently, um, this is subject to consultation, so people can comment on this, challenge us, add, et cetera, et cetera. So once you have that overview, um, and once we know where stakeholders have their priorities, there are a number of ways that we can go about designing the uh, actual benchmark. So on the next slide, you'll see an example of where you take the industry as the center of your benchmark. In this case, we use the example of media. So where do, do media companies, can working media companies contribute to the SDGs? So that could be on uh, an issue like gender equality, but also on an issue like peace and justice. Now, another approach would be to say, okay, we take the an, an, an SDG-centered perspective. Uh, so, of course, relevant to the work on climate is SDG 13 on climate action on the next slide. And there you see how you could use... Um, can I get the next? Yeah, thank you. There you would take SDG 13 as your centerpiece and then see what are the industries with potentially the biggest impact uh, on that SDG and then rank them accordingly. So that's another approach you can take. And the World Benchmark Alliance will probably consist of a mix of benchmarks that do um, uh, with, with choosing one or the other approach, depending what's most effective. So if we move forward, so, and, and as many people would point out that are a bit more familiar with the matter. So the SDGs are of course a fantastic framework. They provide a common language and they provide us a sort of a common agenda. Uh, but the SDGs in itself do not provide enough guidance for companies uh, and certainly not for measuring them. So in building these benchmarks, we go from the SDGs and then look at what sort of best available science can we use uh, to inform any benchmarks. What are sort of the existing principles and normative standards that already inform what we expect from companies? Where do we find already relevant corporate reporting frameworks? Uh, and of course, each sector and each issue has its own sort of um, uh, standards and, 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 and initi initiatives. So this is basically to signal that the SDGs alone do not provide sufficient guidance and that we uh, will use the existing frameworks to help them fill these gaps. And if there are, and if that there are still gaps then, then we'll fill them ourselves. So on the next slide, you'll see that the this is really to put the focus on the fact that we try to be an alliance. Um, so rather than to become sort of a a closed door institution providing more benchmarks. We really try to be an alliance for all of institutions like the ones you see here. So that's a mix of civil society, financial institutions, existing disclosure standards, um, um, multilateral in institutes, um, business networks like the World Business Council and Global Compact. These are really uh, the kind of institutions and organizations that we need to involve in this to ensure that the, that the benchmarks are sufficiently le legitimate they're credible uh, and that they're also recognized so therefore create the impact that we need so that means that you know all so that it's equally important to us that we have oxem uh, as well as avian amro as well as the eat foundation we all we need all these stakeholders to be involved to ensure that these benchmarks create the impact that we need so <clears throat> this is just to give you sort of a as, as my last slide uh, we are right now in the middle of the consultation. We have had uh, three round tables. We have seven more on each continent. Uh, there's currently an online consultation um, and we do a lot of interviews. So whoever wants to involve, you know, if, you've, if, you, if you go to our website, there are a number of ways how to get involved with the, um, uh, with the consultation, including sending us an email and we can set up a call or an interview with one of our team members. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gerbrandt. Really appreciate it. Um, so we will now move on to uh, the Q&A. So we have received a few questions from our audience. Um, so the first question would be um, for Karine. 
so it's about the PI initiative. So how does it compare with the work um, that is undertaken by other initiatives? So PRI, the GIN, the impact measurement projects, how does this uh, UNEPFI uh, initiative uh, kind of compare to those? Karen, are you with us? Thank you, Bernie. Ah. Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you for the for the question. Um, and uh, and indeed, the uh, the initiative sets itself in uh, in complement to uh, to many of those that uh, that you mentioned. Um, maybe just to take a, a few um, a few examples. Um, I think you know if you look, for instance, at um, initiatives focusing on impact investment, um, you know, a key difference, um, I guess, is is really this, uh, you know, this question of of the entry point um, under impact investing. I think you know the the first objective and uh, the the raison d'être really of uh, um, of of the work is to put you know impact first, um, to have an intentionality there. And uh, and financial returns, you know, come uh, come second to that. Um, I guess that talks to also the the origins of uh, you know the, the impact um, investing um, movement, as it were, um, under the uh, under the positive impact initiative. And if you look at the impact based finance, um, that's a you know uh, difference in the sense that. Uh, we're not putting, uh, we're not subordinating, if if you will, um, returns to um, to impact. Uh, the whole objective is to find um, frameworks and uh, and ways forward where impact is something that is taken into the mainstream. And so we're proposing, you know, an analytical framework and a way of constructing products um, that enables us to start from the impact, work back from the impact. Um, and then deliver um, financial products and services, but they are very much, you know, within the mainstream and with uh, with the usual um, return um, risk and return standards. So that's, you know, maybe one uh, one illustration. Um, if you take the, uh, the the different bond uh, initiatives, um, there are a number of, um, I guess, um, distinguishing factors. Um, one, I guess, is you know, already from from the outset, this uh, you know this this approach and and the principles, perhaps in particular, do not focus exclusively on on bonds. It's an approach um, that can be used for other types of financial products. Um, and you know, uh, the other key thing is that the the starting point again for analysis is is one of impact, um, which is different to uh, an approach which is perhaps more sector based um, with you know taxonomies um, of um, of acceptable sectors um, that's uh, you know again a, a key difference so obviously you, you mentioned more initiatives but maybe that's just uh, examples happy to take other ones if uh, if those are required mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And so maybe could you give us um, a few examples of, of, you know, how the principles can be implemented in practice? Yes, absolutely. So as, as mentioned, we're very much at the beginning of, uh, of a journey, but we're very, um, you know, we're very um, happy that we do already have, um, uh, you know, a little bit of, a, of experimentation there on the, on the market with actual PI products and the you know, applying an impact-based approach to um, constructing products. Um, there are some of the, the members that have started to issue, for instance, positive impact bonds. Um, they, you know, they have been repeated issuances, and, uh, and I think we can expect them to be uh, replicated uh, again in uh, in the future. They've been oversubscribed. They've been of substantial um, sizes. Um, so that is, you know, that is one thing. Um, that's that's already there. Now, obviously, we are now, um, you know, working with the members, and uh, you know, the members are acting as a community, basically, um, to explore how an impact-based framework can work for those different combinations of, you know, the, the product and the underlying um, asset, and what we expect to also be producing in in the year ahead and releasing in the year ahead. 
um, are some guidance notes that effectively, um, you know, assist with, uh, you know, provide assistance for financial institutions that would be interested in uh, in adopting that uh, that approach. And we'll also be issuing, uh, you know, certain key tools. Um, obviously, if we want to move to an impact-based approach and to impact-based analysis with a holistic understanding of uh, of impact, um, the question of, you know, what are the impact categories? So a taxonomy, if you will, but it's an impact taxonomy. It's not a, a sector taxonomy. That is part of what um, we expect to also be um, producing next uh, next year to kind of help um, that along a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now a question for you, Jarbrand. Uh, we had um, so a question from Carlo. He's asking, um, is the benchmarking in some way standardized or verified by a second or third party? So perhaps, a, um, so the, the World Benchmark Alliance works in that. It's helpful if I tell something about the, the, the way that these benchmarks are then produced. So. It starts off with multi-stakeholder consultation that informs the, the, the scope and, and of the benchmark. Then we establish an expert review committee in which people sit outside of the World Benchmarking Alliance that provide from different stakeholder backgrounds that provide a review um, of the proposed methodology. Uh, and then companies submit data to us that we then um, verify analysis and of course score. And again, the expert review committee then has a role in looking at it and then we'll publish it. Okay, that's very clear. And in some cases, so in some cases, you might we might want to work with a existing research provider. Uh, in the case of climate, it's very likely that we will work with CDP. Uh, so that brings in another reassurance. Mm -hmm. And what? Um, so you you mentioned that uh, you is going to include all companies and there's no opt out. But what um, what prevents companies from just not providing data to you? So companies, of course, have the choice if they want to provide us with data or not. Um, but um, by scoring each company in scope, uh, we ensure that it just not becomes a, a list of uh, the willing. Um, and so there's a big incentive as these benchmarks then get used by investors or banks uh, and other stakeholders for companies to provide data because otherwise uh, their score is likely going to be lower if we only base it on what's in the public domain. Okay, of course. Um, maybe the next question is uh, for both of you. So um, we have questions from Solen who asked, if negative impact is identified, uh, what are the options? There's the option of avoiding, mitigating, or what, what are the what should be done when negative impact is identified? Maybe Karin, you want to give a try to that question first? Sure, thank you. An excellent question indeed. Um, so, indeed, you mentioned a, a couple of, uh, of the options. Um, so, I think, you know, in the first instance, if we're looking at, you know, we're basically making an analysis um, uh, ex, ex ante, right, before uh, a product is, um, is actually issued um, or released and a financing is, is made. And so, we're looking at a variety of impacts, whether positive and negative, um, which are potential. At that point, they are potential negative impacts. So if, you know, in the analysis something comes up as in, well, there's potentially a negative impact, um, the effectively the requirement is, you know, to go and scratch basically deeper and see, well, will that, you know, will that negative impact materialize or is it actually avoided already because, um, you know, within the project or, you know, by the company itself, um, there are measures that have been taken um, to, to avoid those, um, or, you know, or as something, you know, if, if they can't be entirely avoided, um, can they be compensated? Uh, sorry, can they be mitigated? Um, and where not mitigated, then compensated. So it's the, you know, it's the um, existing best practice on environmental and social risk management that you find here again, um, just integrated into, you know, a holistic appraisal um, of impacts where we're looking at both positive and negative, and uh, and you know, making a that as the you know the, um, the baseline for us to be able to, to put forward something and say yes this is positive impact and you know we can we can defend that position um, because we we understand you know we've, we've taken a full look at it we've not just look at, looked at positive impacts without um, you know ensuring that the, the broader review um, has been made as well mm -hmm. yeah thank you uh, Durban, did you have anything to add to that 
Well, it's about you know getting to work, and if that's a, if it's a company, you need to start fixing it. And if you're an investor, hopefully you start with engaging on a serious matter. Um, uh, but there's of course always the ultimate consequences of disengaging with a company and divesting. But it always hopefully starts with a proper engagement. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um. We had a few questions also regarding uh, developing regions. So, Karin, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that the gap for developing regions was uh, a lot higher, a lot bigger. And so, uh, what would you say, both of you, are the main challenges that need to be overcome um, in developing regions and how, what can be done, what is being done and what can be done in the future? Um, maybe, Karin, you can start with that question as well. Thank you. And uh, again, a, a very important question is, as you say, that's where the uh, the gap is, is greatest. Um, that is where, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, public finance is least available and also where, um, you know, the available private finance um, is also least available. So uh, in terms of what that then leads us to, to conclude, I think it's this notion of, you know, that there is a need here to innovate, but to innovate, um, you know, directly in terms of, you know, what are the business solutions that can be found, that can be created. Um, so it's constructing some of these, um, you know, business models directly around some of the impacts that are wanted. And I alluded earlier on to this notion of having to engage in a new dialogue with, um, you know, between public and uh, and private. Um, and this is, you know, I think one of the the key things um, that uh, that can be done in uh, in emerging and, and developing countries is precisely to try and engage at an earlier stage in program building, in solution design, um, because you know what is critical at the end of the day is to make you know in the first instance before we even think of financing is you know creative ways in which we can bring down the cost to impact effectively, um, and also you know how can we reduce risk, which is the other big problem facing um, investments in uh, in developing countries. And here um, I think you know from from our perspective. Need to build, um, you know, effectively kind of multi-impact programs um, so that we're able to reduce that risk. So by multi-risk, uh, sorry, multi-impact, um, what uh, what I mean is that um, oftentimes um, we look at individual objectives, individual impacts, and then there is, you know, behind that, um, in, you know, different sectors will line up to provide that specific impact. So, for instance. One might be, okay, let's be more um, energy efficient. Um, let's, you know, in terms of our public lighting, um, move to lead lighting, which of course is, you know, an expense, is an investment. Um, but then so that the solution basically that we're suggesting is, is lead. Um, but, you know, that same lamppost with the lead lighting, um, we need to think, you know, perhaps more creatively about what are other impacts that can be delivered through a lamppost. Right, and some of those could actually be revenue generating. We could have video surveillance, you know, for security reasons. So you're increasing, you know, security in the city. You could have air quality monitoring. So you're also, you know, contributing to better air quality, reducing health issues related to air quality. You might be looking at, um, you know, a charging station for different devices, including, you know, going forward the electrical car, you name it. There are so there are different, you know, different things that can be done with a single solution, as it were. So in this case, a lamppost, and you know, that means on the one hand that you're de facto potentially reducing cost to impact, but also if some of these elements are in themselves value generating, that means that different, um, I guess, you know segments of the economy and different corporations might actually see that as the beginning of a new market and so might be willing to invest in that and take some of the risk. So rather than always falling back on you know, public de-risking, um, we might actually be able to carry some of that risk privately. So you're reducing risk, creating a market and, and also um, basically reducing cost to, to impact. So that's the kind of solutions um, I think you know there is a lot of innovation to be done with, in which you know in emerging markets and developing countries we see a lot of potential for, and it's certainly you know we've started to have um, some, uh, some some good engagements 
um, with uh, with the networks that we have in uh, in Africa, particularly in, in Morocco and to some extent in, in South Africa as well. So we'll have more on that next year for sure. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Derben, did you have anything to add? I mean, I think actually one of the questions was uh, about developing region was directly um, directly asked for you, uh, asking about how do you involve in your consultation process, how do you involve um, developing regions um, such as, for example, small island developing states? Uh, how do you involve them? Is there anything done to have them kind of also participate in the consultation? Thank you. Well, this is really at the core. So, in, in both in terms of the World Benchmark Alliance as an institution, where we now have roundtables around the globe, so they're on each continent. Um, in majority, they are in the in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so that is to get their, that input from the very start. Now, on the level of an individual benchmark, I think we often talk about the finance gap, but there's also, if you wish, a business model gap. So we need companies that either produce you know seeds or medicine or uh, are able to produce access to clean energy or internet we need those companies to come up with the business solutions on how they are going to cover that last mile that we always talk about um, so a big part of the benchmark uh, about the, of these benchmark is about how do co companies come up with the inclusive business models to serve these bits and parts of the market uh, and that is really uh, where we think that companies can contribute to the SDGs. So not only about finance, but also about products and inclusive yeah, business models. Um, and by having roundtables with patient organizations, with pharma organizations, we really ensure that these benchmarks address their needs. Mm -hmm. And um, another question for you, Gerbrand. How does the benchmarking um, exercise differ from ESG rating? Um, so how, how is it different from ESG? Yeah. There's overlap, of course, there's, like there always is, but this, I think the distinct difference is, is that we are, in, the, in most cases, interested in, in, we don't want to get a complete picture of the company, but we want to get a picture and an insight in where they can make the biggest difference. Uh, so in general, these benchmarks will be more targeted um, with the biggest focus on, um, on contribution. So where if you think of ESG in the traditional sense, at least, as potential things that could go wrong and where companies should prevent their harm uh, these benchmarks will to a large extent be uh, um, about what can they contribute for us to achieve the SDGs mm -hmm. yeah absolutely thank you very much um, we have uh, another question it's quite different from the previous ones um, for both of you so um, in financing projects with a climate impact, we're currently witnessing new challenges. How do you see the impact of crypto coin and climate coin um, and their impact on the sustainable development uh, of the finance sector? Um, maybe Karin, you want to, do you have anything to, to answer to that question? Thank you, Berenice. Um, I think if I if I understood your the, the question correctly, we're effectively looking at some of the new technologies and data uh, management um, uh, techniques and how those can uh, can contribute. Um, and I think indeed, you know, this is this is going to be um, uh, a key a key aspect. Um, I think as uh, effectively, um, you know, we move to a situation where analysis um, you know needs to be more comprehensive needs to understand a wide range of impacts um, we need to optimize a lot more um, how we collect that data um, from a variety of, of sources and uh, and these technologies um, will be important for us to do that I hope that was the, uh, the direction of the, the question thank you mm -hmm. that's great Gerbrand did you have anything to add to that I am sorry, this is completely beyond my... <laughs> <laughs> really of course, <laughs> totally understood. Um, all right, and so maybe if we touch on another set kind of question, so about regulation and policy makers. So uh, what are their role in, in both of your initiatives? Is there is there anything that needs to be done on the policy side uh, to help uh, those initiatives? Jerban, do you want to to answer to that? Yeah. So sometimes I think because we have so much focus on, on what the private sector uh, needs to do, 
uh, at least in, in the forums that I participate in, that sometimes you know companies fear that the that sort of the accountability burden is completely shifted to them, and that can never be the case. So the the the, the SDGs were set out as an agenda that needs public and private involvement. And so that means that we, we need progress and leadership and accountability on both fronts. Um, and when companies point out that with the government or their regulators stay behind, then they have a point. So it's so I think all I would like to say is that there is a, an, a, a need uh, for the private sector to come on board, uh, but in addition to governments and regulators, not as a substitute. Mm -hmm. Karen, did you have anything to add to that? I very much uh, agree to, uh, to Gerbrand's point there, um, that it's, uh, it's not a substitute. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, the, uh, the, the point made earlier in terms of, you know, broadening perhaps, you know, the, the discussion with the public sector and really getting in at earlier stages in, you know, program design, um, solution building, um, this, you know, for us is um, is, is is one of the the key things that uh, that policymakers and uh, and to some extent regulators should be uh, should be thinking about. Thinking, you know, at the end of the day, the question we're posing is: Can we move towards, you know, impact-based um, tendering, making calls and requests for for impact? Um, mm. but, yeah. mm -hmm. that and and how how do you? <laughs> compliment. <laughs> how do development banks kind of help encouraging private investment? What, how do they fit in this picture? Karen, if you had anything to that me? answer to that, yeah, okay. of course. Or, okay. yeah. Uh, no, there's there's indeed a, a fundamental role to be uh, to be played um, by multilateral development banks. I think you know there's a, a big um, movement underway. Um, of course, as, uh, as we know, to you know, better use um, effectively blended finance mechanisms, and uh, you know, a big focus on uh, on seeing public money, and especially that you know uh, that is with the MDBs as a, as a way to leverage um, private finance, and uh, and so you know, I think from from our perspective, um, that's indeed something that that needs to uh, you know to be pursued because. Um, you know, there there are two there are two issues. One is, you know, in itself the lack of businesses and, and business models and, and the need for actual, you know, value creation and, and business creation. But there is also, you know, including in uh, you know in areas where more public finance is available, the question of you know putting public finance to the best use and using it only where it's really necessary. Um, and I, so I think you know having a, a dialogue around you know impact. And the uh, you know the uh, the impact to um, you know to the public dollar that is spent um, is is a really important conversation we need to be to be having as well and with the with the multilateral development banks and how you know the private sector can help along those lines so it's an additional angle I guess. Mm -hmm. Jerbrand, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I think that's an excellent point. <laughs> Um, uh, one last question um, around stranded assets. Um, what can be done about them and what should be done with stranded assets? Uh, Jerburn, did you have anything to to answer to that question? Um, well, it's going to be, you know, creating clarity on, on the, the nature of these stranded assets and what companies can do about it. And so if we talk about so this is so this is where it gets really important when we talk about the corporate climate action benchmark and we talk about transition pathways that we start mapping where companies are in their transition and to really understand where their assets are at risk and um, um, and that will be i think a big driver for for many of the investors to stay engaged on this issue but what i think we need to do is that we um i think we understand standard assets on a conceptual level um, but we need to get to a stage where we can say something really on a company level. Mm -hmm. Karen, did you want to add anything to that? Again, very very supportive of what uh, Gerbrand has said, but I, I think the uh, you know one thing is indeed understanding and identifying those uh, those stranded assets um, much better. And I think there's you know there's important work um, underway to to do that. And I think the complementary 
move to that is to look into what the new assets are. Um, I think we're, you know, this is this is very much reflective of, you know, a disruption in uh, in the economy overall. I think we sometimes um, don't see that there's actually quite a close um, connection in a way between, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, kind of the sustainable development imperatives of planetary boundaries, social pressures, et cetera, and, you know, the need to deliver impacts there. And on the other hand, the fact that there is, you know, a major industrial revolution um, underway, these things are, you know, are, are connected. Um, and, you know, also connected is some of the, you know, some of the keys basically to, to unlocking the, the, the new market, some of the most successful players in the new economy. Um, have in common that you know they're very focused on providing a you know a service and a value to the end beneficiary, and I think if we go back to sustainability issues, what we're finding is you know we need to again resolve a number of you know human needs within planetary boundaries. So it's again it's about you know delivering that um, that value that service to uh, you know to end beneficiaries to people <laughs> basically. And, uh, and so as companies think about, you know, stranded assets, I think, you know, in the same time, they need to be thinking of, okay, so, you know, what is the, uh, what is the, the new economy about? And, uh, and actually that new economy, you know, part of that new economy is, is indeed the, it's the SDG agenda. It's resolving and attending to a number of needs. And so suddenly, you know, rather than looking at an ocean of, of problems such as, you know, hunger, conflict, et cetera, you know, potentially looking at what is, you know, a major market and major number of, of clients who have tons of needs to be resolved. So if you can put those at the heart of a business model, and if you're, you know, your company at the moment is somewhere in that impact value chain and you can move closer to, you know, the end delivery to a beneficiary, then there's a, you know, a major market opportunity. So I think it's a, you know, we're seeing a, a we're at the point now where basically, you know, economic, you know, pure as we had understood economic needs and more of these, you know, planetary or social needs, we're really starting to see the, you know, to feel as a fact that they're connected. And so that's, I think, the, um, you know, the major opportunity there as well. Mm -hmm. then maybe on a on a positive note there you <laughs> stranded assets. Absolutely. Well thank you very much. Uh, maybe if you had a very quick last word about the next steps and how to get involved in either of your initiatives. Um Karen, as you were talking just now, maybe if you have a very quick word about how to get involved in the in the positive impact uh, initiative and how can if a company, if someone is listening to us and wants to get involved, how what can they do? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. So there's um, basically a number of um, you know of, uh, of clusters of work that's happening. You know, big clusters around basically financial products and how we move to delivering those on an impact basis and having a lot more um, you know financial products that deliver um, positive impact and contribute to the SDGs. So you know we've basically got working groups per types of products and underlying assets. So you know those. Um, we very much welcome all financial institutions who are interested in, in working with us on that and submitting, you know, cases of, uh, you know, products that um, that we could move in that direction so we can develop, you know, the, the specific frameworks that are needed for those. And then more on the kind of business development side, um, you know, we're trying here more, more on a kind of local basis um, to construct these dialogues that we mentioned between public and private. And so here, um, you know, we're very much interested in, in involving um, whether it's the financiers, corporates, or uh, you know public players listening in, um, you know if uh, if you'd like to get involved in those, bring cases, or you know see some of the ones we're working on, then please just uh, reach out and uh, and we'll gladly um, involve you. There's a place for everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Karin Gerbrandt. Uh, what is the next step from now? You're still in the consultation phase, but how can people um, get involved as well in your initiative? So there's, of course, the, you know, if you would go to our website, you can find the, the roundtables that are being planned around the world, and you can find the one closest to wherever you might live. Um, and please let us know if you would like to attend. Um, there is the option of joining one of the online consultations. Um, you can approach us. And of course, if you're an institution that would like to become an ally, please let us know, uh, and we could together explore that further. So. Um, and the, the consultation runs until the 1st of May and we would like to receive input in whichever way that suits you most. 
Well, thank you very much both for uh, your interventions uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's really appreciated and um, we thank all of, our, all of our listeners as well and wish a great rest of the day to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.